We can now start summarizing our data. To do so, we will use different measures, including the central tendency measures. Very loosely, these measures give us a middle value of our data. But before we do so, there are a few notation and vocabulary elements that we must see. How we note the different measures we take depends on whether they are done on samples or on populations. When we calculate measures based on data taken only on samples, we talk about statistics. On the other hand, when we calculate measures based on data taken on a population, we talk about parameters. If this is any help, notice how the first letters match up. When we write down our statistics, we will use letters in lowercase from the Roman alphabet. But when we write down parameters, we will mostly use Greek letters, although there are a few exceptions where we will use capitalized Roman letters. The first central tendency measure we'll see is the mean, which you may know as the average. Simply put, the mean is the sum of the values divided by the total number of values. Here's the equation for the mean of a sample, where we have x bar, the symbol for the mean of a sample, and then you have x1, the first value in your data set, to which you'll add x2, the second value in your data set, to which you'll add x3, the third value in your data set, and etc. until you reach the last value, nth, in your data set. You will divide the sum of all of your values by n, the total number of values in your sample. We can simplify this by simply writing down sigma, which means the sum of x, the values in your data set, divided by lowercase n. Let's take a look at the equation for calculating the mean of a population. It's not very different from the equation of calculating the mean of a sample, but there are a few little differences. The first of these differences is in how you write down the symbol of what you're calculating. Instead of x bar, we have the Greek symbol mi. This is the symbol for a population's mean. And instead of using lowercase n, you will use capital N. Capital N is the number of values in your population. Let's do an example. Imagine that the sports center has compiled a number of times per week athletes from the basketball team come to the gym outside of team training. Here are the results. Because we have results for all the players in the basketball team, we are calculating the population's mean, so we must use this equation. We first do the top section of the equation, where we do the sum of all of the values, like this. This gives us a sum of 44. We then divide the sum by the number of values we have in our population, which is 14. The result is 3.14. We can then say that the mean number of times at least from the basketball team come to their gym on their own time is 3.14 times per week. You'll notice that 3.14 is not an actual value of our data set. This is one of the characteristics of means. Another characteristic of the mean is that it can be influenced by extreme values or very big or very small values. This is especially true when our n is small. Let me illustrate this for you. Imagine that you have a group of seven small children weighing all together 280 pounds. So in average, each child weighs approximately 40 pounds. If a 400 pound sumo wrestler was to join the group, the average weight for this group of people would be 280 plus 400 pounds divided by 8, which would give us a mean of 85 pounds. Notice how much larger of averages, even though we added only one value to our sample. Indeed, because 400 is so much larger than 40, it has greatly influenced our mean. Now on the other hand, if we had had a group of 200 children, the sumo's weight would not have been as influential as the average. Let's take a look at this. So with our 200 children, their total weight would be 8,000 pounds. Divide that by 200, it gives us an average or a mean of 40 pounds. 
Now, if we add our sumo wrestler to this group, still weighing strong at 400 pounds, our total weight for the group would be 8,400 pounds, which we would divide by 201, because we have 201 people in the group. So our new group average would be 41.79 pounds. This mean is still slightly larger than the mean weight of only the children, but the difference is much slighter than when our n was much smaller. You can see that means are not always an appropriate approximate of the center of our distribution, so you must use caution when you see the use of the mean. A second measure of central tendency is the median, which is also known as the midpoint of your data set. There are only two steps to do to find the median. First, you must arrange your data in order, and then you must select the middle value. Imagine that you are traveling to Vietnam and you are looking for places to sleep in Hanoi. There are lots of hostels in Vietnam, so you pick those that have air conditioning. You notice that prices range quite a lot, so you decide to pick the one that falls straight in the middle. First, you must arrange the values in order, like so. Then, you pick the middle value. Since you have an odd number of values, your median will actually be a value in your data set. So we can say that the median price for a hostel that has air conditioning in Hanoi is of $14. Notice that the data you had originally falls in the category of raw data. Data rearranged in order is a data array. But what happens when you have an even number of values? Notice that indeed, once you've got your data array, the median falls between two values. All you must do is add together the two middle values and then divide them by two. So with this data set, the median is 14.5. Contrarily to the mean, the median is not really affected by extreme values. We can verify this by going back to our kids and sumo example. Here, we have eight values in our data set. Once they are in order, we can see that the median is of 40. The fact that we have an extreme value, even in a small distribution of values, did not influence the median. The third central tendency measure is the mode, which is the value that occurs the most in your data set. A distribution is said to be unimodal when there is only one value that is the most frequent. Distribution is said to be bimodal when there are two values that occur with the same greatest frequency. And a distribution is said to be multimodal when there are more than two values that occur with the same greatest frequency. A distribution can have no mode, this is when there are no values that occur more than once, or all values have the same frequency. So you ask your best friends how many times they eat boxed macaroni and cheese dinners per week. So here are your results. Let's see if there is a mode in here. We notice that 2 has the highest frequency of the group. So your distribution of value has one mode, which is 2. On the other hand, consider this distribution of values, which is the number of times your close family members eat box macaroni and cheese per week. Notice that there is no value that has a higher frequency. You might be tempted to say that the mode is zero because there is no mode, but this is not correct. Indeed, zero can be a value in your distribution, just like it is here. You must instead state that the distribution has no mode. In a given distribution, the values of the central tendencies are not necessarily equal. This is well reflected in the shapes of the distribution. So starting with the bell-shaped distribution, we can estimate here that the mean, the median, and the mode are all equal to 18, all three measures being equal in a perfectly bell-shaped distribution. In a right skewed distribution, the mode is lower than the median, which in turn is lower than the mean. It is the exact opposite in the left skewed distribution, where the mean is lower than the median, which is lower than the mode. It's important to note that the more skewed a distribution is, the bigger the difference between the central tendency measures.